college football nerds got our Ohio State 2019 college football preview coming at you with a guest host, Kyle Lamb of BuckeyeGrove.com. It's the Rivals affiliate for Ohio State. He also hosts a great podcast, Unscripted Ohio, and it's all going to be in the description. Links for him. Also, you can follow him on Twitter. He's got all the Ohio State goods for y'all. I know we've got a lot of Ohio State fans watching this that have been following us for a couple of years now, but we also got some people from ACC country and SEC country. want to remind y'all, please, everybody, if you haven't yet already, give us a like. It helps the channel out a lot. Also, give us a subscribe. Hit that notification bell. It helps us even more. We're college football nerds, so we've branched out and we're talking about Big games across the country every week. And right now, we're going to talk about Ohio State. So let's get into it. All right. First question, Kyle. Uh, you know, there's been obviously a ton of talk about Justin Fields. And I'm not going to blow that up this whole episode because your insight is valuable to us. And we've heard all we're going to hear about Justin Fields, especially until fall camp starts and, and all that. So one of the things I'm curious about in terms of you know, you lose Dwayne Haskins, who was huge to that offense last year. Um, and, and we're thinking about Ohio State in, ter- in terms of, okay, what if Justin Fields isn't as good as Dwayne Haskins? Does that mean Ohio State is even worse than last year? But I was thinking more along the lines of, you know, if you lose a little bit of production at quarterback, I feel like there's a lot of low-hanging fruit to gain on the defensive side of the ball that might net out some of the losses from an offensive production standpoint to potentially have Ohio State even be a better team this year than they were last because defense was such a liability. Um, do you think I'm on the on, on the right track with that, or are you have any other thoughts? I, I think there's a little bit to that. I, I think, but actually, it's important to look at I think both sides of the ball because you know I, I, I we you know you guys discussed this when you were on with me on the, on the podcast last year. Obviously, Ohio State was not having a typical Ohio State defensive year, so there's a lot of room I think for improvement there. Uh, you know, the linebackers have to play better and, and, and be a little more consistent in the secondary. And I think there are a lot of early signs that Ohio State's defense, I think, is going to be back to a more traditional Buckeye defense this upcoming season. But I think on the off- offensive side of the ball, too, like even if we accept that Justin Fields is probably not going to be as efficient as Dwayne Haskins was as a passer, you know, I think that there are other ways that Fields can, you know, make up for a loss in some of that accuracy, namely his legs. I think he's going to be a much better runner, and I think he's going to add a, a you know a different dimension to the Ohio State offense. So I th- I think that they can afford a little bit of a drop off in quarterback production, just because he'll add that added element as a runner. And then I, I do think that the Ohio State defense, I'm not sure how good it's going to be this year. I think it can be really good, but I think regardless, I would expect it to be better than what we saw last year. So, Josh, you know, we had our show, um, our Clemson show, and uh, you Ohio State fans that are checking us out, you should check out our Clemson preview as well since y'all are going to be in the thick of the playoff hunt. That's another team that's going to be too, so it's kind of interesting. Um, one of the things we talked about was how Clemson has an objectively poor schedule this year. It's it's going to be a probably an 80s, 70s, 80s strength of schedule, depending on how the other division plays out for their conference championship game. Um, But one of the things we said was it doesn't necessarily mean anything in terms of how elite you are or not if your schedule is bad, because a lot of that's outside of your control. Uh, One of the things we referenced was 2014 Ohio State, who didn't have a particularly tough schedule, but they wrecked their schedule. Uh, And that's one of the things we like to see is if you're good, then you can handle the teams you should handle. Um, Ohio State this year does not have a tough schedule. And and Kyle's probably rolling his eyes right now. Um, But I want to separate that from something that might be their fault because it's not. Uh, We have done gone out of our way to praise Ohio State on this show in terms of of out-of-conference scheduling. They do it better than anybody else. I think Oklahoma and Ohio State are two of the best. Um, They couldn't help the TCU thing, so they had to swap it with Cincinnati. But all of that to say they don't have a tough schedule this year, but that doesn't mean they can't be an elite team. Are they kind of in the same boat as Clemson in that they may not play anybody great this year. They may not, but it still won't matter at the end of the year if they absolutely wreck their schedule, we'll be able to see that they're elite. I certainly think there's an argument for it. I mean, at the end of the day, when we have this whole discussion about what is or is not a good schedule, that discussion is usually used as a way to evaluate your performance against the teams you did play and how well you beat them or didn't beat them and how that compares to the schedule strength. 
But just because you have a strong schedule doesn't mean you're good, and just because you have a weak schedule doesn't mean you're bad. Uh, you know, we, we tend to look at how you perform against that schedule. I know Bill Connolly for a long time has been someone that preaches really hard that if you beat up on bad teams, that's a sign of being a really good team. And if you followed our show for the past several years, you'd know that we preach the same thing pretty hard because – um, from anyone from an anal analytics standpoint will tell you that often beating up on bad teams is as much an indicator of being a good team as anything else. When you look down Ohio State's schedule, it's quite possible that Ohio State's not going to play a ranked team until either Penn State or Michigan at the end of the year. Um, interestingly, if you look at ESPN and their FBI, you know, they have Michigan State 14th. I, I just don't really buy that at all, frankly. Um, there's and, and the rest of it, you know, maybe Nebraska, maybe Northwestern, maybe Wisconsin. It's worth noting that within a conference, and, and we've said this a lot too, right? Every conference goes 500 against itself. So someone in the Big Ten kind of has to be ranked unless everybody's equal. Because as long as you're not all going, uh, you know, four and five or five and four in conference play, somebody's going to come, has to come out with two conference losses and then of that, like that set, that Nebraska, Michigan State, Northwestern, Wisconsin set, somebody's probably going to end up being ranked. And you, I say by default, and that's not necessarily a slight. The point is, it doesn't matter whether the conference is really strong or the conference is really bad. The conference is going to have a 500 record against itself. And what tends to happen is somebody with one or two losses at that point in the season is going to end up being ranked, um, really regardless of how strong the conference is externally. But you know, relative to the rest of the conference, I think Ohio State can be very good. I think Ohio State could easily cruise through its entire schedule, maybe have one test at the end of the year. And, you know, we've seen this before with Ohio State. One of the problems when you've got these two back-end games is, one, you can lose one of those two games, be one of the best teams in the country, you know, arguably the best team in the country. I think some people would may have made that argument before, like when they lost to Michigan State. And you don't make the playoff because you have that one random loss at the end of the season. I think that's where the length of the lack of a schedule otherwise hurts you because it's it's hard to really prove yourself otherwise to say, well, that one game was a fluke if you don't have anything else on the resume. But the last point I'll make is 2014 Ohio State actually had a very, very weak schedule. That year they lost to Virginia Tech, played the rest of the season, and it, it I mean, the, the Big Ten that year was pretty terrible. Um, but Ohio State rampaged through the Big Ten, you know, our our model at that time actually had Ohio State beating Alabama in the bowl game, even though Alabama was a 10-point favorite. And, you know, obviously Ohio State did beat Alabama. And what our analytics said was, yeah, Ohio State has a weak schedule, but they've killed them. And Ohio State, especially at the end of the year, was clicking like nobody's business. You can have a weak schedule and be really, really good. So I, I think for Ohio State, I, I wouldn't take anything away from them based on the, their strength of schedule. What I would say, though, is the weak strength of schedule makes it really, really hard because those one or two games that are very important, let's say it's Penn State or Michigan, maybe probably one to two ranked games on the schedule total, you really have to win both. And I don't know how fair that really is in the grand scheme of things, uh, but you know that that's where it's probably going to be. You have to win both if everybody else in the other conferences are going undefeated as well. Um, one thing I hope we don't see this year is a lot of talking heads like to jump on the schedule thing and it's, it's easy fodder for them. And I hope they don't do that with Ohio state because, and especially pointing out the, the Cincinnati game, like it, without understanding all the background of what Ohio state has done scheduling, it really rubs me the wrong way. And you Ohio state fans do it too with some of the SEC teams where you'll cherry pick one year where they didn't have a great schedule and ignore like all the other years uh, or, and according to y'all neutral site games don't count either. Um, so talking, talking about these backloaded games, which Ohio state has had for ages. I mean, since urban Meyer showed up, um, I can remember, I think this is the third or fourth season I can remember where, they didn't have much throughout the year, again, not their fault, um, or they had like the Oklahoma opener, a long gap, and then a tough November. Um, is it kind of a blessing in disguise, though, with Ryan Day coming on and still, I know he had the three-game primer last year, but coming on and trying to get the whole game day management thing under his belt to be a well-oiled machine come November, is it a blessing in disguise, or would you, Kyle, rather see one of these games in, you know, mid-September uh, than having them at the end of the year. 
Well, okay. So I, I, you know, two things on that. I, I would say the game management part of it, you know, remember Ryan Day did, you know, coach the first three games last year. And I thought he did a brilliant job, you know, handling the fall camp and then, you know, the organizational uh, aspect of, of the first three games for Ohio State last year. I, I thought they came out, looked like a well-oiled machine. So I think having that experience under his belt helps a little bit this year. So I think where Ohio State fans are more, uh, probably more concerned is, is not so much how Ryan Day will handle the team coming out of the gate but the, just the fact that they're going to be throwing Justin Fields out there and he's going to be at quarterback. And it will be nice, I think, that the schedule is backloaded and it gives him a chance to you know progress and develop and, and, and not be counted upon to do too much right away. But I will say, like, I, I, I know you guys are probably not as bullish on Nebraska as maybe I am, but I think that that game in Lincoln is, is a huge test for Ohio State early. And I, I you know, I, I'm, I've actually got that game as Ohio State potentially losing. I, I, I kind of right now I'm forecasting that they will lose that game. And that's, you know, with the caveat that I don't know what Justin Fields will be like early on, but I'm just expecting there to be a few, you know, chinks in the armor. And so I think that's going to be an interesting game and one that I, I think Ohio State fans are actually going to be pretty nervous about. So not to give you too much pushback since you're a guest, but I think Josh and I are going to disagree on that. One, from a talent perspective, it's not even, you're not even in the same universe. Um, two, yes, that game was close last year, but it was a little weird in that I, I think you play that game 10 times, Ohio State wins nine of them and seven of them are blowouts. Um, if, if, if I'm being honest, that game was just downright weird. And you could have a weird game again, but that doesn't mean that you should expect a weird game. Josh, talk a little bit about Nebraska and why, I hate to put you on the spot because I know you don't have the numbers in front of you, but we had a discussion about this last year on our show, or maybe it was in a live show, about how Nebraska kind of looking like they were peaking and should be ranked coming into this this season this year was based a little bit on fool's gold. Um, maybe talk two minutes on that and, and why you think that may not be the case. Well, again, anytime you look at a team and their success, you, you have to sort of you know pinch it against how they did against the schedule they played and you know what their strengths and weaknesses were. Last year with... Nebraska, their biggest weakness was their defense was atrocious. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, Martinez and um, the fact that, you know, Martinez hasn't been able really to stay healthy enough for them to be, you know, what they want to be. But at, at the end of the day, you know, Nebraska's losing games because they were giving up a ton of points, right? And then the opener against Colorado, I say opener, right? Akron gets canceled. They give up 33 points to Colorado. It wasn't, wasn't a very good team. They give up 41 to Wisconsin, whose offense was atrocious, 42 to Purdue. 56 to Michigan. Um, it, it's not like their defense really ever showed up. And even in some of their wins, like Minnesota, 53 to 28. Well, one, uh, Minnesota dropped several games against really bad teams last year. And you got to be careful taking too much from that because uh, I, Captain Row the Boat in Minnesota is probably not going to be the most stable individual from a head coaching job. And the team's already kind of picking up that sort of look. Uh, and then Ohio State, too. I mean, yeah, it gave Ohio State fits, but like we talked about, there's a lot of weird stuff there. Um, you know, they lost that game because they gave up 36 to Ohio State. And they kept it close, though, because Ohio State had particular problems dealing with certain types of offenses. Their defense got really easily discombobulated. The linebackers never knew what they needed to be. Uh, and I think a lot of times, especially the end of the year, Ohio State switched into a lot of zone coverage because they were getting beat in man. And if you could kind of get them isolated, they would give up cheap, easy points a lot. Happened to... Uh, you know, uh, Ohio State had this happen multiple times over the course of the season. It's something we flagged early against TCU, and I think it continued to be true. But again, Nebraska, you know, getting a lot of tre credit for that Ohio State game. But when you look at the rest of the season, I mean, yeah, they blew out Minnesota, but Minnesota was in a bad stretch. They still got 35 to Illinois. Um, I mean, what what really is the best win then otherwise? You know, maybe 9-6 to six over Michigan State. But, I mean, Michigan State sucked. So I don't really know... They had a great defense. Michigan State had a great, a great defense, terrible offense. You score eight points on yeah. them, you're going to win the game. I mean that that was well. I mean they lost to Oregon year. seven to six, right? It so right. when you look at Nebraska, I mean there's a lot of hype about the fact that they bring back their quarterback and some of these playmakers, but it's not like they were particularly good at a lot of spots. They're losing, replacing some guys in the offensive line. The defense is um, kind of a mixed bag in terms of what's coming back and what's not. 
But the level of improvement that's going to take for Nebraska to be an overly good team, given how, especially how bad they were defensively last year, I, I just don't buy that they're going to be going to be that great. I mean, they had a weak schedule. They struggled against anybody with a pulse in that schedule. Um, had a couple close games like Northwestern, but we can go into how good Northwestern was or wasn't. But it just, again, if you can't stop the other team from scoring points, you're going to have a hard time really taking a step forward. So, Kyle, we talked a little bit in our Georgia preview about how I was frustrated that Georgia wasn't getting more discussion nationally. I felt like they were unfairly flying under the radar until the Alabama game last year. Um, I get kind of the same feeling about Ohio State where I'm looking around and I'm like, okay, we got Alabama and Clemson, but we've got to fill playoff slots with two other teams. There's going to be five to seven teams in the national title race come you know mid-November. Ohio State is in all likelihood going to be right there in the thick of it. So one, Kyle, do you feel like people should be talking more about Ohio state than they are right now? And two, what's the temperature of expectations from Ohio state fans there on the ground? I think, you know, I think that Ohio state fans are cautiously optimistic and and I think that's a a fair level of expectation. And I, I, but I I definitely feel like Ohio state is being overlooked. I'm going to share a little anecdote with you guys. Um, I I talked about this on my podcast and, and shared it on Twitter with some folks. And I I think people will find this kind of surprising. Um, So I did a little thing several years ago. This is very nerdy. Some stuff that you guys will appreciate. I had this little, um, yeah, I had this little thing where I went through and used the consensus recruiting rankings and then weighted the previous four classes to get an idea of what kind of talent's coming back. And it's not exact, obviously it's not exact, exact science, but I, I did a correlation over five years and it was something like 0.8 correlation, uh, from success to, to this weighted system that I did where, you know, freshmen and senior classes were weighted at like 20%. The, uh, it was 25% for the junior class or 25% for sophomore class and, and 35% for, for the junior class. Okay. I actually did that for this year. I hadn't done it the last couple of years. I I went back and did it for the 2019 season and weighted using that algorithm. Ohio state is actually the most talented team on paper using those last four classes. Now that does not to say that they should be number one over Alabama or Clemson who obviously have, you know, key quarterbacks coming back and more experience, but it just goes to show Ohio state is right there in the mix. Uh, So yeah, I think that Ohio state is being undersold and that, that, one through 85, they had, they still have as much talent as anybody in the country. I personally would probably put them number four, number three, number four, number five on paper, but I do think they're absolutely right there with the talent to, to win the title. If, if, if fields turns out to be as good as he can be. A follow up question for you just a little bit. I know I said we wouldn't talk a whole lot about fields, but Instead of talking about Fields specifically, um, what do you think you need out of him um, to be a legit title contender in terms of like, what are your expectations? If he hits those expectations, you expect Ohio State to be right in the thick of it. Is it is it 80% of Haskins? Is it just JT Barrett? Like, it, I wonder because it's, it's hard to compare because like you said, He's going to bring something to the table with his legs that maybe Haskins didn't, even if the passing game falls off a little bit. So, so what do you need out of him for Ohio State to be, you know, third or fourth at, at worst uh, come December? Yeah, you know, Barrett, I think his final year at Ohio State was somewhere in the neighborhood of like 63% accuracy. But, you know, he was obviously had more of his uh, attempts were were shorter because, you know, he wasn't as accurate on the long ball. You know, Dwayne Haskins was something, you know, ridiculous, like 70%, I think, for the season. And uh, he was pretty accurate on the long ball, so which makes that even more impressive. I think if, if Fields can be somewhere in the middle, you know, uh, you know, hit two thirds of his passes, um, you know, he's got a good arm. It's not as good as Haskins, but it's probably, as good if not a little bit better than Barrett um, if he can you know just hit on the long ball be fairly accurate uh, I think he's I think that's going to put Ohio State's offense you know similarly to where they were at last year maybe not as good but I think it'll be more balanced this year because they'll have a better running game I think um, you know J.K. Dobbins with with some of the running backs that they have coming in and, and the offensive line being a little more stable on in the run game and, and then having the added dimension of fields running the ball. I I think that that'll make Ohio state's offense a little more balanced and maybe a little more consistent, especially the first half of the year where they were very up and down at times last year. 
Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned it and, and this is going to come across as, as me being negative to Ohio State fans, but I actually think it's more of a positive for this season. I wasn't as high on Dwayne Haskins as a top 10 quarterback draft pick coming out. I, I think he is he has all the tools in the world to be an NFL starter one day, but I wanted him to be like a second round guy where he wasn't forced artificially too early into action where he could learn as an understudy and really sort of mature before he had to have that on his shoulders. And I say that because I feel like a lot of his productivity last year was sort of in just in aggregate in the scheme. And that scheme is still going to be there. So I think that that Ryan Day and, and this offense did a really good job of finding production. If you look back at the, I think it was the Penn State game, I think he only completed like six. I went back and watched every throw, and I think it was like six or seven throws the whole game that weren't that were beyond like five yards, four or five yards from the line of scrimmage. It was a lot of short stuff. It was and it was killing him. It was working. Um, and and I think that they know that with fields or with whoever they have at quarterback, they have enough scheme and enough talent at, at all the skill positions that they're going to get productivity out of the offense, regardless of who they have. So I don't, I don't necessarily think we're going to see a huge drop off from Haskins in as a whole, in terms of the offensive production, it might be more from the running game. Uh, we'll see. Um, Josh, we saw what happened last year with the Michigan game. Um, and there was a lot of, I think Michigan fans are so frustrated this year because they felt like if they were going to beat Ohio state last year was the year to do that. Um, do you think that, that this is just kind of a monkey that they're not going to be able to get off their back and Ohio state really doesn't have to worry as much about that Michigan game as maybe, a gotcha game somewhere along the way, like in Nebraska. We see this with, with Ohio State every year where the games that they know they circle on their calendar, generally they win. It's somewhere down the line where they get the loss. So do we? Do you see some of that? Because I know you're not super high on Michigan this year. Do you see that being a possible situation this year where if Ohio State has a loss, it might come as one of those slip-up games and not come from Michigan? I certainly think it's entirely possible, right? There's a lot of stuff when you look at predictive uh you know predictive analytics or predictions in college football where even your biggest gaps in talent like a number one team versus a number 15 team when you get really high up on the scale for very good teams probabilities are pretty you know pretty average in terms of how likely someone is to win and to unpack that statement what i mean is it's rarely, you know, more than like 65% or 70% likely in, in a complete vacuum that let's say number five beats number 15. And what that means is, you know, how, wherever you think Michigan st- is or wherever you think Ohio State is, and you can take one way or flip them the other, there's still a pretty good chance that one of those teams is going to beat the other just randomly. And I think last year's Ohio State-Michigan game sort of bears that out. Not to say that Ohio State shouldn't have won or that there weren't reasons why Ohio State would win. There were things we flagged. We didn't know they were quite as bad as they were, but we kind of noted in our preview that Michigan had shown signs of not being able to really stay with people, and especially that they'd shown times when that in the past over and over again. But Michigan was theoretically the better team going in that game and won. So what's the point of all that? Well, Ohio State might well beat Michigan regardless of whether Michigan's the better team. But Ohio State might also lose another game just because when you play teams above a certain caliber, there's always a chance of that loss. Now, the schedule issue does step into that a little bit. I mean, it's it's hard to look at the schedule and see anybody that's particularly good. Now, Ohio State is tripped up against teams that haven't been overly good, you know, like Purdue. Um, so it, it's always out there. I don't think you really should view it as likely. But, uh, you know, it's, it's entirely possible that Ohio State beats Michigan regardless of who's even the better team um, and trips up somewhere else. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that's interesting about Ohio State's schedule this year is there's, there's not the, the peaks and valleys, but there is a lot of, like, 
Nebraska, Michigan State, Northwestern, Wisconsin all in a row where maybe not one of those teams is elite, but if you're going through a four-game grind, you know, it, it could wear you down because if you play, you know, a bunch of zeros and a 10, that's one type of hard, but playing four sevens in a row is another type of hard. So, um, okay, so we're Kyle, Josh, and I are going to give our predictions for our state for the season. I'm not going to put you on the spot because you probably have your own type of pre- previews that, that you want to do. Um, but I will ask you this question. Um, if we see Ohio State in the playoffs or we see them hoisting that national championship trophy, what key thing do you think will have happened for them to get there? And if they don't, is it the reverse? Is it that thing didn't happen or is it something else? Yeah, I, I think it's two things. I, I, I think, like you mentioned, it, uh, you, you guys have both you know made reference to the linebackers. They've got to get better linebacker play, um, you know, both at the line of scrimmage as far as, you know, tackling and, and, you know, just bringing guys down to the ground, but also in pass coverage, you know, they were very inconsistent last year. So they got to get better linebacker play. And, you know, it's, it, I know it's so uh, cliche, but really, it, it, you know, there's a reason why we're talking about Justin Fields so much today. Um, uh, it, because he is really the biggest, I think, the biggest unknown with this Ohio State team outside of maybe the linebacking core is, and I, I think, you know, they don't need Justin Fields to to show up and be an All American right away and, and be a top ten type of pick. Obviously, he's going to have two years of eligibility, so that's not a, a factor. But they just need him to show up and 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 be somewhat accurate and and be consistent with throwing the ball. Because if he does, uh, that's that would be the reason that they get to the playoff and and have a chance to advance. All right, Josh. So why don't you go ahead and give us kind of your at least initial thoughts on a on a predict prediction for Ohio State this year? I think the most difficult thing for me with Ohio State is when you give a prediction, if you just talk about the average win loss record for Ohio State, that number's probably not really reflective at all of what their final record's gonna be. And what I mean by that is I think there's a very good shot that Ohio State goes eleven and one. I think that's the most likely scenario. And if they don't go 11-1, and one, then there's actually, in my opinion, almost more likely than not that they lose more than two games. So, you know, let's if I gave a prediction, I would probably say 11-1. and one, And I think there's probably about a 70% chance that happens. But if things go wrong, and the biggest thing with Justin Fields, I think, is the reason he's so important is there's nobody behind him. And there's a lot of questions about Fields. He has not did not have a good spring game. There's reason to be critical or skeptical of his ability to perform. And if he's not able to perform at a competent level, all of a sudden a lot of things get a lot more difficult and the whole season could be in serious jeopardy because there's really, you know, you've got a couple transfers, you know, be it, you know, Hoke or, you know, the West Virginia kid. And I'm not sure that anybody's going to really be able to give you consistent production at the at, at the quarterback position, then all of a sudden, you know, maybe you lose three or four games in that scenario. So I, I would say an 11 and one record for Ohio state, but sort of with a big asterisk that one, like I, I completely agree with the Kyle that I think they're not given anywhere near enough credit for the amount of talent that's returning at Ohio state. I think it's comical that for example, in the FBI, their rating, their FBI ratings, 14.1 and Michigan state's 14. They, return a sort of a similar number of players on both sides of the ball, you know, seven for Ohio state defensively eight for Michigan state, but Ohio state's talent level coming in is radically higher. Um, and they're not giving being given anywhere near enough credit for that. So, you know, with these very highly talented teams, they tend to overperform your expectations for returning starters and whatnot. I kind of like the fact that Ohio State's having turnover because especially in the defensive side of the ball, I think they had issues last year, a little more concerned on offense, um, but, I mean, you know, the defense should be quite good. Most of the season last year, they were excellent, other than a couple of games where they got tripped up. So I, I do think 11-1 and one is likely. Um, I think I, I just have a hard time seeing Fields being good enough to put them at, like, the 12-0 and 0 mark to be either one that consistent or – I'm not saying they lose to Michigan. Um, I think probably more likely than not on my mind they beat Michigan. But let's say this is a 65% chance of beating Michigan. That means you got a 35% chance of dropping that game, and then I'm going to say something like a – you know, 20, 30% chance of dropping some other game, some other point in the season. And that that's how I come to my result. I, I'm sitting on 11, one, two, and I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. I, if I had to predict the, the Michigan game right now, which I think there is an outside shot that that's Ohio state's only ranked opponent. Um, and before y'all get at us in the comments with, you know, 
the rankings are a construct of the media and SEC favoritism and all that. When I say ranking, I mean one of the top 25 best teams in the country. I don't think anybody on Ohio State's schedule besides Michigan is one of the top 25 best teams in the country. I think Penn State takes a step back. Um, uh, and that was – Penn State last year wasn't I – I don't think they were a great team. Um, I do think that it was a great win because it, it's hard to get a win there. Um, but to get Penn State at home, they go on the road to Michigan. I think somewhere in that four-game stretch that we already touched on, Michigan State, Northwestern, Wisconsin, um, Nebraska, I think they drop a game there. But because they drop a game there and not Penn State or Michigan, I think they're in the playoffs because I think they're going to – they're gonna kill whoever wins uh, the West. I think we've seen that before. Um, and so they can absorb a loss, you know, five weeks into the season, six weeks into the season, far better, which I think is silly. I think it's ridiculous that if you lost in September or if you lost in November, one's look more favorable than the other. A loss is a loss. But in that regard, and obviously we're predicting what other teams would do too. I think an 11 and one, 12 and one Ohio state, gets into the playoffs um, unless they have a game where it's just ridiculous, where they lose to Purdue and get killed, uh, something like that. Um, and I don't see that happening this year. I actually think the the old bugaboo from the Meyer era of looking completely unprepared one or two games a year against a scrub team is gone. I don't think we're going to see that with Ryan Day anymore. There's just something about him that I get in terms of how he approaches the game, I don't think we're going to see that. I think the locker room is going to be a little bit different for the better. Um, all right, Kyle, why don't you close us out with any final thoughts, um, and, and then I'll shut it down. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what you guys have said today. I, I mean, I, I think, I, I, you know, I know you didn't ask, but I will say, I mean, I, I kind of tentatively have Ohio State losing twice um, because I, I have okay. them losing in Lincoln, whereas you guys don't. Um, and I, I, I think that they lose that Michigan game this year. I'm not really as sold on Michigan as some of the algorithms out there and, and some of the preseason prognostications. But I do think that, you know, they, they've got a lot of offensive talent coming back, a lot of experience coming back. And I think, uh, you know, just – sheer sheer probability they're bound to get one sooner or later so I, i've got ohio state losing those two but I, I really honestly i do think that the talent's being you know undervalued a little bit and and if fields is better than than he looked in the spring you know I, who knows I, th I think this team is capable of running the table but we'll see all right y'all that's our preview for the ohio state buckeyes want to thank Kyle Lamb of Buckeye Grove. He's also got a great Unscripted Ohio podcast that you guys should check out. And, and I know I'm kind of preaching the choir because there's a lot of Ohio State fans that already follow us, and that's probably where a lot of the traffic for this video is going to come from. But we also have a lot of non-Ohio State fans that watch a lot of our stuff, so I want to make sure that they are also in tune to other important teams throughout the country. So you SEC fans and Pac-12 fans and ACC fans, make sure you Follow Ohio State this year, too. You need to be educated. Um, all right, y'all. That's it. Thanks so much, y'all. Have a great week. And God bless.